Chapter Four of Tante. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Tante by Anne Douglas Sedgwick. Chapter Four. She stood for a moment with her hand resting on the lintel, and she surveyed an apparently unexpected audience with contemplative melancholy if she was not pleased to find them so many she was at all events unresentful and gregory imagined from mrs forrester's bright flutter in rising that resentment from the sun goddess was a peril to be reckoned with smiling though languidly smiling she advanced up the room after her graceful and involuntary pause white fringes rippled softly round her a white train trailed behind her on her breast the silken cloak that she wore over a transparent under-robe was clasped with pearls and silver she was very lovely very stately very simple but she struck her one hypercritical observer as somewhat prepared calculated and conscious as well thanks dearest friend she said to mrs forrester who meeting her half-way down the room and taking her hand asked her solicitously how she did i am now a little rested but it has been a bad night and a busy morning she spoke with a slightly foreign accent in a voice at once fatigued and sonorous her eyes clear penetrating and singularly steady passed over the assembled faces turned all of them towards herself she greeted sir alliston with a welcoming smile and a lift of the strange crooked eyebrows and to miss scrotton who eager and illuminated was beside her ah ma chérie she said resting her hand affectionately on her shoulder mrs forrester had her other hand and so standing between her two friends she bowed gravely and graciously to lady campion to miss harding to mrs harding who in the stress of this fulfilment had become plum-coloured and to gregory jardine then she was seated mrs forrester poured out her tea Miss Harding passed her cake and bread and butter. Lady Campion bent to her with frank and graceful compliments. Miss Scrotton sat at her feet on a low settle, and Sir Alliston, leaning on the back of her chair, looked down at her with eyes of antique devotion. Gregory was left on the outskirts of the group, and his attention was attracted by the face of little Mrs. Harding, who, all unnoticed and unseated, gazed upon Madame Okraska with the intent liquid eye of a pious dog the wavering uncertain smile that played upon her lips was like the humble thudding of the dog's tail gregory remembered her face now as one of those rapt and hypnotized that he had seen on the platform the night before in the ovation that madame okraska had received at the end of the concert he had noticed this same plum-colored little lady seizing and kissing the great woman's hand shy by temperament as he saw to the point of suffering he felt sure that only the infection of the crowd had carried her to the act of uncharacteristic daring he watched her now finding her piteous and absurd but some one besides himself was aware of mrs harding miss woodruff approached her smiling impersonally with rather the air of a kindly verger at a church yes she seemed to say she could find a seat for her she pointed to the one she had risen from mrs harding almost tearful in her gratitude slid into it with the precaution of the reverent sightseer who fears to disturb a congregation at prayer and miss woodruff moving away went to a table and began to turn over the illustrated papers that lay upon it her manner retired and cheerful had no humility none of the poor dependent's unobtrusiveness rather gregory felt it showed a happy pride as if a fortunate priestess in the temple she had opportunities and felicities denied to mere worshippers she was interested in her papers she examined the pictures with something of a child's attentive pleasure gregory came up to her and raising her eyes she smiled at him as though on the basis of last night's encounter she took him for granted as potentially a friend what are you looking at he asked her as he might have asked a friendly child she turned the paper to him the great wall of china 
they are wonderful pictures gregory stood beside her and looked the photographs were indeed impressive the sombre landscape the pallid sky and winding as if for ever over hill and valley the astonishing structure like an infinite lonely consciousness i should like to see that said miss woodruff well you travel a great deal don't you said gregory no doubt madame okraska will go to china some day miss woodruff contemplated the desolate wall but this is thousands and thousands of miles from the places where concerts could be given and i do not know that my guardian has ever thought of china no it is not probable that she will ever go there and then unfortunately i do not always go with her i travel a great deal but i stop at home a great deal too my guardian likes best to be called von marwitz in private life by those who know her personally miss woodruff added smiling again as she presented him with the authorized liturgy gregory was slightly taken aback he couldn't have defined miss woodruff's manner as assured yet it was singularly competent and no one could have been in less need of benevolent attentions i see he said she looks so much more polish than german doesn't she what do you call home he added have you lived much in england by home i mean cornwall said miss woodruff who was evidently used to being asked questions my guardian has a house there but it has not been for long it used to be in germany and then for a little in italy she has only had less solitudes for four years she looked across at the group under the chandelier there is still room for a chair her glance indicated a gap in madame von marwitz's circle this kindly solicitude amused gregory very much she had him on her mind as a sightseer as she had had mrs harding and she was full of sympathy for sightseers oh thanks no he said his eyes following hers i won't go crowding in she won't mind she will not even notice miss woodruff assured him oh well i like to be noticed if i do crowd gregory returned smiling his slight irony was lost upon her yet he was sure of it she was not dull her smile showed him that she congratulated him on an ambitious spirit well later then we will hope she said you would of course rather talk with her and here is mr drew so that this chance is gone who is that singular young man gregory inquired watching with miss woodruff the newcomer who found a place at once in the gap near madame von marwitz and was greeted by her with a brighter interest than she had yet shown mr claude drew miss woodruff replied with some surprise do you not know i thought everybody in london knew him he is quite a famous writer he has written poetry and essays artemis wedded is by him that is poetry and the bow of ulysses the essay on my guardian comes in that oh he is quite well known mr claude drew was suave and elegant and his high stock-like collar and folded satin neckgear gave him a somewhat recondite appearance with his dark eyes pale skin full smooth golden hair and the vivid red of an advancing habsburgian lip he had the look of a young french dandy drawn by ingress my guardian is very much interested in him miss woodruff went on she believes that he has a great future she is always interested in promising young men this no doubt was why miss woodruff had so kindly encouraged him to take his chances he looks a clever fellow said gregory do you like his face miss woodruff inquired mr drew as if aware of their scrutiny had turned his eyes upon them for a moment they were large jaded eyes lustrous yet with the lustre of a surface rather than of depth dense velvety and impenetrable well no i don't said gregory genially decisive he looks unwholesome i think oh unwholesome miss woodruff repeated the word thoughtfully rather than interrogatively yes perhaps it is that it is a danger of talented modern young men isn't it they are not strong enough to be so intelligent one must be very strong in character i mean if one is to be so intelligent perhaps he is not strong in character perhaps that is what one feels because i do not like his face either and i go greatly by faces so do i said gregory after a moment in which they both continued to look at mr drew he went on 
i wondered last night what nationality you belonged to i had been wondering about you for a long while before you looked round at me you had heard about me she asked he was pleased to be able to say oh i wondered about you before i heard people are so often interested in me because of my guardian said miss woodruff everything about her interests them but i am an american if you were not told that is to say my father was an american and my mother was a norwegian but though i have never been to america i count myself as an american and with right i think she added we always spoke english when i was a child and i remember so many of my father's friends some day i hope i may go to america have you been there do you know new england my father came from new england no i've never been there i'm very insular and untraveled are you it is a pity not to travel isn't it miss woodruff remarked but you like it here in england yes i like it here with mrs forrester and in cornwall but here with mrs forrester always seems to me more like the life of europe english life as a rule is i think rather like boxes one inside the other she was perfectly sweet and undogmatic but her air of cosmopolitan competence amused gregory serenely of opinion for his part that english was the only life well the great thing is that the boxes should fit comfortably into one another isn't it he observed and i think that on the whole we've come to fit pretty well in england and we all come out of our boxes don't we he added pleased with his application of her simile for a madame von marwitz yes i know said miss woodruff also evidently pleased that is quite true you all come out of your boxes for her but as a nation they are not artists the english are they they are kind to the beautiful things they like to see them they will take great trouble to see them but they do not make them beauty does not grow here that is what i mean it is in its box too and it is taken out and passed round from time to time you do not mind my saying this you perhaps are yourself an artist dear me no i'm only a lawyer i'm shut up in the tightest of the boxes said gregory miss woodruff scrutinized him with a smile i should not think that of you she said you do not look like an artist it is true few of us can be artists but you do not look shut into a box either beauty to you is something real not a pastime a fashion no i cannot think it when i saw your face last night i thought here is one who cares one counts those faces on one's fingers even at a great concert so many think they care who only want to care to you art is a serious thing and an artist the greatest thing a country can produce is that not so gregory continued to be amused by what he felt to be miss woodruff's naivete he was inclined to think that artists however admirable in their functions were undesirable in their persons and the reverent enthusiasm that miss woodruff imagined in him was singularly uncharacteristic he didn't quite know how to tell her so without seeming rude so he contented himself with confessing that beauty in his life was kept he feared very much in its box they went on talking going to an adjacent sofa where miss woodruff while they talked stroked the deep fur of an immense persian cat hieronymus by name who established himself between them gregory found her very easy to talk to though they had so few themes in common and her face he discovered to be even more charming than he had thought it the night before she was not at all beautiful and he imagined that in her world of artists she would not be particularly appreciated nor would she be appreciated in his own world of convention a girl with such a thick waist such queer clothes a face so broad so brown so abruptly modelled she was he felt a grave and responsible young person and something in her face suggested that she might have been through a great deal but she was very cheerful and she laughed with facility at things he said and that she herself said and when she laughed her eyes nearly closed and the tip of her tongue was caught with an effect of childlike gaiety between her teeth the darkness of her skin made her lips by contrast of a pale rose and her hair where it grew thickly around her brows and neck of an almost infantile fairness 
her broad brown eyebrows lay far apart and her grey eyes were direct deliberate and limpid from where gregory sat he had madame von marwitz in profile and he observed that once or twice when they laughed she turned her head and looked at them presently she leaned a little to question mrs forrester and then rather vexed at a sequence natural but unforeseen he saw that mrs forrester got up to fetch him tante has sent for you miss woodruff exclaimed i am so glad it really vexed him a little that he should still be supposed to be pining for an introduction he would so much rather have stayed talking to her on the sofa she continued to stroke hieronymus and to keep a congratulatory gaze upon him while he was conducted to a seat beside the great woman madame von marwitz was very lovely she was the type of woman with whom as a boy he would have fallen desperately in love seeing her as poetry personified and she was the type of woman all indolent and indifferent as she was who took it for granted that people would fall desperately in love with her her long gaze now told him that it seemed to give him time as it were to take her in and to arrange with himself how best to adjust himself to a changed life it was not the glance of a flirt it held no petty consciousness it was the gaze of an enchantress aware of her own inevitable power gregory met the cold sweet melancholy eyes but as she gazed as she slowly smiled he was aware with a perverse pleasure that his present seasoned self was completely immune from her magic he opposed commonplace to enchantment and in him madame von marwitz would find no victim i have never seen you here before i think she said she spoke with a beautiful precision that of the foreigner perfectly at ease in an alien tongue yet not loving it sufficiently to take liberties with it gregory said no she had never seen him there before mrs forrester is it seems a mutual friend said madame von marwitz she has known you since boyhood you have been very fortunate gregory assented she tells me that you are in the law madame von marwitz pursued a barrister i should not have thought that a diplomat a soldier it should have been is it not so gregory had not wanted to be a barrister it did not please him that madame von marwitz should guess so accurately at a disappointment that had made his youth bitter i'm a younger son you see he said and i had to make my living when madame von marwitz's gaze grew more intent she did not narrow her eyes but opened them more widely she opened them more widely now putting back her head a little oh she said that was hard that meant suffering you are caged in a calling you do not care for oh no said gregory smiling i am very well off i am quite contented contented she raised her crooked eyebrow are you indeed so fortunate or so unfortunate to this large question gregory made no reply continuing to offer her the non-committal coolness of his smile he was not liking madame von marwitz and he was becoming aware that if one didn't like her one did not appear to advantage in talking with her he cast about in his mind for an excuse to get away the law madame von marwitz mused her eyes dwelling on him it is stony yet with stone one builds you would not be content i think with the journeyman's work of the average lawyer you shape you create you have before you the vision of the strong fortress to be built where the weak may find refuge you are an architect not a mason only so could you find contentment in your calling i am afraid that i don't think about it like that said gregory i should say that the fortress is built already there was now a change in her cold sweetness her smile became a little ambiguous you remind me she said that i was speaking in somewhat pretentious similes i was not asking you what had been done but what you hoped to do i was asking it was that that interested me in you as it does in all the young men i meet what was the ideal you brought to your calling it was as though with all her sweetness she had seen through his critical complacency and were correcting the manners of a conceited boy gregory was a good deal taken aback and it was with a touch of boyish sulkiness that he replied i don't think really that i can claim ideals 
definitely now the light of mockery shone in her eye in evading her in refusing to be drawn within her magic circle he had aroused an irony that matched his own she was not the mere phrase-making woman by no means the mere siren how afraid you english are of your ideals she said you live by them but you will not look at them i could say to you as stasius de virgil in the purgatorio that you carry your light behind you so that you light those who follow but walk yourselves in darkness you will not claim them no and above all you will not talk about them do not be afraid my young friend i shall not tamper with your soul so she spoke sweetly deliberately yet tersely too as though to make him feel that she had done all she could for him and that he had proved himself not worth her trouble mr claude drew was still on her other hand carrying on an obviously desultory conversation with miss scrotton and to him madame von marwitz turned saying and what is it you wish to tell me of your carducci you will send me the proofs good oh i shall not be too tired to read what you have written here was a young man evidently who was worth her trouble gregory sat disposed of and a good deal discomposed the more so since he had to own that he had opened himself to the rebuff he rose and moved away looking about and seeing that miss woodruff had left the room but mrs forrester came to him her brilliant little face somewhat clouded what is it my dear gregory she questioned she asked to have you brought haven't you pleased her mrs forrester who had known not only himself but his father in boyhood was fond of him but was not disposed to think of him as important and she expected the unimportant to know in a sense their place and to show the important that they did know it there was a hint now of severity in her countenance it would sound he knew merely boyish and sulky to say she hasn't pleased me but he couldn't resist i wasn't a la hauteur mrs forrester at this looked at him hard for a moment she then diagnosed his case as one of bad temper rather than of malice and could forgive it in one who had failed to interest the great woman and had been discarded in consequence mercedes she knew could discard with decision well when you talk to a woman like madame von marwitz you must try to be worthy of your opportunities she commented tempering her severity with understanding you really had an opportunity your face interested her and your kindness to little karen she always likes people who are kind to little karen it was pleasantly open to him now to say little karen has been kind to me a dear good child said mrs forrester i am glad that you talked to her you pleased mercedes in that she is a delightful girl said gregory he now took his departure but he was again to encounter miss woodruff she was in the hall talking french to a sallow little woman in black evidently a lady's maid who had the oppressed anxious countenance and bright melancholy eyes of a monkey allons miss woodruff was saying in encouraging tones while she paused on the first step of the stairs her hand on the banister ce n'est pas un cas perdu louise nous arrangerons la chose ah mademoiselle c'est que madame ne sera pas contente pas contente du tout quand elle verra la robe was louise's mournful reply as gregory came up i hoped we might go on with our talk he said he still addressed her somewhat as one addresses a friendly child i wanted to hear the end of that story about the hungarian student he died in davos poor boy said miss woodruff looking down at him from her slightly higher place while louise stood by dejectedly he wrote to my guardian and we went to him there and she played to him it made him so happy we were with him till he died shall i see you again gregory asked will you be here for any time are you staying in london my guardian goes to america next week did you not know with miss scrotton oh yes eleanor told me and you're not going to you're not to see america yet no not this time i go to cornwall you are to be alone with mrs talcott all the winter you know mrs talcott miss woodruff exclaimed in pleased astonishment no i don't know her eleanor told me about her too 
"'It is not being alone,' said Miss Woodruff. "'She and I have a most happy time together. "'I thought it strange that you should know Mrs. Talcott. "'I never met anyone who knew her "'unless they knew my guardian very well. "'And when are you coming back?' "'From Cornwall? I do not know. "'I am afraid we shall not see each other. "'Oh, for a very long time,' said Miss Woodruff. "'She smiled. "'She gave him her hand, "'leaning down to him from behind the banister. "'Gregory said that he had friends in Cornwall "'and that he might run down and see them one day, "'and then he might see her and Les Solitudes too. "'And Miss Woodruff said that that would be very nice. "'He heard the last words of the colloquy, with louise as his coat was put on in the hall alors il ne faut pas renvoyer la robe mademoiselle mas non mas non no snooth tyrons de fer miss woodruff replied springing gaily up the stairs her arm with a sort of dignified familiarity in which was encouragement and protection cast round louise's shoulders End of chapter four